slash wives who win. Hey, Facebook. Good afternoon. Oh, the light is kind of shady, but okay. You guys' light is good. Their light is, ooh. Let me see if I can do some adjusting. I got my lamp on back there. It might not. Oh. Mm, I didn't get my lamp out with the office. You know what? We're just going to have to rock out. That's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, we're going to have to just rock out. So let me get some folks on here. So we can get this conversation going. And I can get... Start doing some things I need to do outside of the house. I did a lot. Okay. Looks like we're here. Hey, sis. Camille, let me know if that's a good connection. Thank you, Wanda. Hey, Giovanna, how are you? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, bless the Lord. Well, hey, girl, I am here today. Yes. Well, last week, what was I, last Saturday? Oh, I had an event. I spoke. I spoke at an event last Saturday, so that's why I wasn't on last Saturday. Then the Saturday before that was the book signing and live wife chat session, so all that was all in one. So that's how we did that on the 5th. So we'll be on next week, and then no live chat. No um, first of the week live chat in September, but we will have the remaining um, online live. But as we all know, hey, Facebook, I know you guys, I know. I'm, I'm getting off of Periscope now and telling the Periscope folks to come over here because it's not working in my favor on Periscope. Okay, guys, Facebook.com forward slash wives who win. All my replay viewers, if you want to hear this message, you have to go to Facebook.com forward slash wives who win to get this message on today. All righty. Thank you all for chiming in. Okay. Okay. Okay, I am back. Yeah, it interrupted because I had to get off of um had to get off a of periscope. Had to get off a of periscope. Hey, if you guys don't have your word, I need you to get your Bibles today. Well, you should have your Bibles every day, honestly. But if you don't have your Bible, I want you guys to see this. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll show it later. Uh if you don't have your Bible, Please go ahead and get your word, get your sword on today. Um, yes, thanks, Wanda, or thanks, Giovanna, because we are going in some scriptures on today. So hopefully when you guys are on chat, I, I hope that you can take that hour and just spend with me. If not, I understand kids have practice, you have chores, things, yada, 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 life. So if you can, I understand that as well, well but it will be great if you could. And so we can get into the word, right? So... You know what, I'm going to pray this morning. I'm going to do something a little different. I normally don't pray on wife chat here. I normally pray in the live session. Let's just go ahead and pray so we can just make sure that anything that tries to come in the atmosphere will not. Uh, we can eliminate all distractions, even distractions in our own mind, and our own hearts. And that some of us are holding on to things that are causing us to be blindsided and that has um, caused barriers to come against us and has stopped us or severely preventing us from operating in our best self, in our own lives, in our marriages, and beyond. Okay? Is that okay with you guys? Let's go. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to, to be able to gather with my sisters in the Lord. Lord, I thank you, O oh God, that all of these women that are not robbery to come on this live today, O oh God, not to hear what I have to say, but to hear what you have to say. God, some of them are going through different issues in their lives, in their marriages, and beyond, O oh God. But what I do know is that you are a keeper. I also know, Lord God, that you will not put more on us than what we can bear. Lord, and I also know that whatever the process is, oh God, that you will give us the strength to endure it in the name of Jesus. But we know that the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but those that can and will endure. Those that can and will endure under pressure, under hard times, under tragedy, under uncertainty, Lord God, under our insecurities, oh God. We want to be a generation of women. We want to be a generation of wives that can and will endure, God. So I thank you for all of these wives on this chat, God. I thank you for all of the wives, all of the women that are part of Wives Who Win, that are part of Detour Movement, God. Every woman that I come in contact with, oh God, I just want to be infected Oh God, so that their lives can be transformed, Lord God. I want the glory of the Lord to be so evident in my life and what I say and what I do and how I respond, oh God, that they will know that there is a God that can save them. There is a God that can save their marriage. There is a God that can save their family, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that we're not here to put on a facade, oh God. We just thank you. 
in the name of Jesus. Did you guys hear the prayer? I saw that it interrupted. Come on, Perry. I mean, come on, live. No. Come on, come on, come on. It interrupted. Hey, Linda, how are you? Were you all able to hear the prayer? It interrupted, and I was praying. But to God be the glory. And I pray that Facebook captured the prayer. Okay, because we're having some little difficulties, I need you guys to respond if you can. Um, if I ask a question, just so I'll know that we are on. Because this, you know, uh, technology has its way. But God will have his way on today. So, um, before I get started and talk about the, the eight principles that will avoid you, um, it was choppy, but I got it. Okay, yeah, Wanda, I'm trying my best here. This thing is just, you know, I'm just going to give God the glory anyhow. Amen. Uh, because the enemy, you know, he doesn't want <laughs> the word to get out. And I can't blame any, everything on him because I know the internet situation at my home. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, God will be glorified and lives will be transformed as a result of what God has given me to say on today. Um, for those that don't know me, I listen to, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a, quite a bit, not a lot. But I do have quite a bit of spiritual, unofficial mentors. And why I say unofficial is because I have not gone to these people more so to say, hey, will you mentor me um, in any capacity? These people that I know that I listen to online, one was um, Dr. Miles Monroe. And I still listen to a great uh, majority of his material and content because he was just such a wise person. And the word of God tells me that do not despise wisdom from those that are wise. And many people, Dr. Miles Monroe, Dr. Emerson Egridge, um, Dr. Tony Evans, um, James McDonald, John Gray. I mean, I, some of these people I listen to on Hillsong, um, Brian Houston. Uh, some of these people I listen to in my car. Joyce Myers have played a, a significant role in my life in helping me to renew my mind. I mean, just a great majority of people. Uh, Bishop T. Jakes has helped me with leadership, uh, as well as Dr. Mon Mon Monroe has helped me with leadership. My apostle, Alan H. Simmons, has helped me to with leadership and, and learning how to love unconditionally. So there are so many people that in my life that I consider uh, my unofficial mentors. And my apostle, of course, is, is one of my mentors. <laughs> but um, the other people that I've never met met uh, there's a great majority of people that I listen to for different aspects of my life and I often tell people that wherever you are in life uh, so the, the, the different areas or different spheres of life that you influence people or that you have uh, um, good afternoon Kendra welcome that you have uh, connections with that you influence people or that people uh, look to you as you should be connecting to a source of something that's going to help you sustain in that area uh, what does that mean? Uh, some level of education you should be obtaining, some level of inspiration, some level of motivation uh, you should be obtaining from these individuals because we don't know it all. Hence why we go to school for two years, four years, however long many of us have gone to school. So we don't know everything, so we have to learn certain things about our lives. So you consider yourself a coach if you're saying you're a mentor, if you're saying you're a leader, a visionary in any capacity, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, if you are a mother, if you are a wife, if you are um, a manager on your job, you know, in any capacity that you hold, whatever space that you hold, fitness trainer, whatever space that you hold, you should be hearing from someone um, or, or getting taught by someone how to be better in that area. Hey, Keisha, you should be hearing from somebody of how to improve in that area. Now, the Bible has everything. Has It talks about leadership. It talks about finances. It talks about marriage. It talks about being a mom. It talks about all of that. So, in addition to the Word of God, I truly believe in God. believe, you know, when he talks about wisdom, wisdom comes from other people in books that they've written and audios that they have recorded and videos that they have recorded uh, and programs that they have and things of that nature. So, when we talk about wisdom, wisdom comes in so many different forms. So, in, the addition, in addition to using your Word, you should be using other resources that are inspired by the Word of God. God that will help you in the area that you are in and a lot of times we don't do that 
you know, many of us, we will, we will get a CD or a book or sign up for a program to be a life coach or to be a great speaker or to be an entrepreneur, but we won't sign up for a program or, or, or invest in a book or a CD to be a great wife. Come on, somebody. I know I'm talking better than what you're responding right now. We won't sign up for something that will help us to be a better mother. We won't sign up for something that will help us to be a better employee on our job to be able to get along with one another. We won't sign up for something that will help us to love people better and to love people unconditionally and to extend grace so in any area of your life and I often say this if you've ever heard, heard me talk when I'm live or in person you need to be connected to resources that will help you to be better in every area of your life right faith if it's faith if it's fitness if it's your finances if it's fruitful relationships if it was if it's whatever you need to be doing that so got that out of the way now I want to talk about just briefly the uh Accountability partners. I posted something in the Wives Who Win Club about accountability partners, and many of you had expressed interest in wanting and desiring accountability partner. So how we're going to do this, I will assign the accountability partners, but what I need from you is I need each of you to email me. Um, because I don't know if I have, I have some of your email addresses, but I don't have all of your email addresses. So I need you to email me so that I can partner you with an accountability partner. And what I'll do is, is I have a chart of your name, your email and phone number. So what I need you to email me is your first and last name, your email, and a good contact number for these people to get in contact with you. And what I just ask is over the next 48 to 72 hours that you reach out to your accountability partner, the person that I match you with, that you reach out with that person, and that you form some type of relationship, bond, Facebook friend, them, whatever you feel like you need to do in order to begin um, speaking with this person and so that you guys can start your journey as accountability partners. What is an accountability partner? Account accountability partner is someone that holds someone accountable to their goals, to their values, to their truths, to their beliefs. So in our instance, as wives, as, as leaders, as uh, mothers, as uh, faith, faith, uh, faith, women of faith and Christ followers, that person is going to hold you accountable to those things as you will hold them accountable to those things. Now, however you guys outline it, that's up to you. I'm not coming up with that. You guys have to do that on your own. So just pray and ask God how you guys should do. So if you want to pray together a couple days a week, that's fine. If you want to go out with this person once a month or every other month, that's fine as well. If you want to have a check-in call and just go over some goals and things of that nature that you have going on, that's fine. If you want to partner together and go to an event, whatever you guys want to do, I'm just giving some suggestions. So holding each other accountable and making sure that you guys come up with clear goals individually of what you want to achieve in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 6 months, 1 year, 5 years, and holding each other accountable to that. So is that understood, guys, gals, to be politically correct? Okay. A lot of stuff, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Okay, so we're going to get into the lesson for today. And today we're talking about in principles that will help you to stay off or help you to avoid staying on the crazy cycle. Um, you may be asking me, what is the crazy cycle? Before I go any further, those that don't know who I am, I'm Cheryl Ravenel, a.k.a. The Wife Coach. And as you guys really know, I'm extremely uh, passionate about about uh, position and wives to win in their marriage against all odds. Marriage is a God idea. So that means that it is, um, you cannot do marriage without doing God. Hallelujah, somebody. You cannot do marriage without applying the principles of marriage, which is found in the word of God, to your marriage. And if you have been, if you've not been doing that, you may have seen a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion and a lot of issues and problems within your marriage because you are going about marriage marriage and doing it the Hollywood way versus the Holy Word way. So we want to make sure that in our marriage that we are looking at the principles of marriage through the Word of God and what God has to say about marriage and how we're supposed to react and respond and communicate and connect with our husbands so that we can have a fruitful and successful marriage. And these principles are not only for a marriage covenant. These principles are related to other relationships in your life. These, these principles are relating to your relationship with your children and things of that nature. So we want to make sure that we are taking in the word because the word is not one-sided and one scripture can apply to many different areas of our lives so we want to make sure that we are studying uh, to show ourselves approved a workman need not be ashamed rightly dividing dividing the word of truth uh, you know what? I didn't give you guys my email address. So the email address is official wives who win at gmail.com if someone can type that can I type it official wives who win at gmail.com uh, email official wives who win at gmail.com and again you're going to email me your first and last name your phone number and your email address well i'll have your email address official the 
wives. Ooh. So official wives. Wives. I'm trying to type you guys. Who win at gmail.com. Official wives who win at gmail.com. Okay? So email me your phone number and first and last name. Hey, Jasmine, how are you? Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, so the principle I'm going to share with you, I'm sure studying to show our self approval work may need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Crystal. And we want to make sure that thank you, Tracy, that we're taking the word of God. We want to make sure that we're taking the word of God. Thanks, Crystal, John, and Tracy. I don't know if you heard me, but it kind of skipped just now. We want to take the word of God and take scripture and apply it to whatever area in our life we need it to be applied to because the scripture is so um, universal. It's a universal word that we that we have. So eight principles I, I listened to as I was telling you about my different unofficial mentors and people that I learned from and lean and glean from. One of those people is um, Dr. Emerson Egridge, and he has this principle on love and respect. Has anybody ever heard about him? Amazing. He used to be a pastor for like, was it 30 years? He was a pastor for a very long time. I think it was like 30 years. He was a pastor for a long time, a couple de decades, and then he just started practicing. He's a psychologist as well. And then he just started doing counseling and, and things of that nature in the psychology G realm. Uh, he's an amazing man of God. He's so full of wisdom. He's been married for like 30 something, 40 years. I don't know. His son is like 37. 38 so he's been married if not 40 years almost 40 years so you can go fact find it fact check if you want I can't remember offhand um, but he is so amazing and, and and God has just given him a gift to be able to share the word of God and when it comes to marriage so he has this thing he calls a crazy cycle and the crazy cycle and and I and I didn't know for a long time that's what I was operating off of, but I never knew it had a name. <laughs> so when I started listening to him and he was talking about the crazy cycle, I was like, man, I've been doing that. We've been doing that. My husband and I have been doing that, but we never knew what the name. Yes, author love and respect. But we never knew what the name of it was. We just knew that craziness was going on in our marriage. So the crazy cycle is without respect, you don't give love, and without love, he doesn't. Without respect, he doesn't give love, and without love you don't give him respect so without respect he does not give you love he does not show love toward you and without him showing love toward you you refuse to show him respect does that make sense so what happens with that let me know if that makes sense you keep going on this cycle I'm not going to show you no love if you don't show me no respect well I'm not going to show you no respect if you don't show me no love I'm not going to show you no love if you don't show me no respect. I'm not going to show you no respect if you don't show me no love. So you go on and on and on and on and on and on in that cycle until the marriage is destroyed. You know what, guys? I need to... Sorry. I had something on the stove. Sorry. <laughs> I'm smelling it. Oh, Jesus. Okay, sorry. I'm human. This is real life scoping, real life stuff. Okay, so for a long time, for quite for the first couple years anyway, my husband and I would get on these little cycles, and we didn't really understand what it was. I didn't understand what it was. Uh, I don't know if he understood what it was, but I just felt like it was just... Like, why are we here? Why do we keep being at this place? And, you know, a lot of the actions that our husbands may or may not do, we feel like they're not loving us. Because normally we wouldn't say, why are you not respecting me? You would say, you don't love me. Because how we, how we um, decipher love is what they do toward us and for us. Am I in the room, somebody? So the way they treat us or not, right? What they do for us or not, how they respond to us or not, we interpret that and we measure their love toward us. And on the flip side of that, they measure their respect, you respecting them on how you treat them, how you respond to them, what you do or not do, what you say or don't say. They interpret or measure the level of respect that you have for them. The greatest need for a man is respect. Hey, Oriana. 
The greatest need for a man is respect. Oriana, I emailed you back, hun. Is not love. Typically, if something happens in your marriage, your husband will not say, well, you don't love me. The first thing he's going to say is, you don't respect me. Am I right about it? The first thing he's going to say is, you don't have, you don't respect me. You don't respect my position. You don't respect my authority. He is not going to say, you don't love my position. You don't love my authority. Whereas the first thing that we will say, you're welcome, honey. The first thing we will say is that you don't love me. So now that you understand that, because in the Bible, it, it mandates women to honor and respect their husband. Now, it mandates all of us to love one another unconditionally, right? The agape kind of love. In our husbands, we have different types of love. We have the or phileo, the brotherly sister love, because they're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have the eros love, which is a sensational sexual love. But we are supposed to love everybody unconditionally. So that's a law. That's a, that's a standard, right? But when it comes to marriage, God did not mandate us as wives in the word of God to love our husbands. He mandated us to respect our husbands. Let's go to Ephesians 5. I told you to get your Bible. We're going to get to Ephesians 5. How many of you got your Bibles? Ephesians 5. Let's read it. I'll give you I told you to get your Bibles. So I had actually been told. Sorry about that. I had actually used your Bibles at the beginning of the live. So hopefully many of you were able to do that. Uh, so we're going to go. Okay? Ephesians 5. And I pray some people are delivered today. I pray some marriages are set free on today by this so you can have an understanding because in the beginning i talked about the marriage as a god idea so anytime you take god out of the equation anytime you take god's word out of the equation you're going to get your results so in a heated fellowship moment in a disagreement right in deciding on something if you take the word of God out of the equation, you're going to get your results, even when you don't agree. We can ad agree to disagree. And if we disagree strongly, we can then go to the Father and say, God, I'm not settled with this decision. I know my husband wants to do it this way. I know he desires this, but I'm not settled with this decision. Instead of going to him and going head up to him and telling him why he shouldn't do whatever, you're going to God. Sometimes you can't go to him. And you know your husband better than anybody, I would hope, at this point, or getting to know him, right? So sometimes you may not can go to him and, and express yourself to him in the way that you need to express yourself to him for various reasons. It could be his personality. It can be um, he's having, you know, a bad week or a bad month. It could be whatever. It can be you know you don't want to be you don't want to be confrontational because most men don't like to be confrontational it doesn't mean he's a bad man it doesn't mean you married the wrong person it doesn't mean you know whatever you know and, and i would just want to 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 eradicate that right now every time you get into an, a, a disagreement or argument or, or something happens that does not mean that you marry the wrong person that is a trick of the enemy the word of god tells us in john 16 and 33 let me back up a little i believe it's john 20 oh god you guys Oh, Lord Jesus. And I, listen, I am first partaker of this message. I am first partaker of this message. So don't ever think I'm throwing stones. Don't ever think I have arrived. Don't ever think that my marriage is perfect, that I am perfect, because I am here to let you know that it is not. I am continuing to grow. I am continuing to learn. I am continuing to improve each and every single day. Okay? So let's, let me go to John 16 first. I know John 16 or 33, but there's another scripture that talks about trouble. That talks about trouble. And I think I learned it. I think I um, saw it today. First John. Is it First John? Staying in light. No, that's not it. That's talking about the light of Jesus. Is it First John 16 and 20? When I was doing my devotion this morning. First John 16 and 20. I assure you. Okay, yep. First John 16 and 20. I assure you. No, John 16 and 20, not 1 John. Can somebody type that for the rest that may come on? John 16 and 20. John 16 and 20. It says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you that you shall weep and grieve, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and read down to 23. A woman, when she gives birth to a child, has grief. 
This is for a moment. Kirsten, you're about to go in that season again. <laughs> to God be the glory. Thank you, Oriana. A woman who gives birth to a child has grief, right? Many of us that are mothers, we felt that experience. Oh, boy. We have anguish. We have agony because her time has come. But when she has delivered the child, she no longer remembers her pain, trouble, and anguish. I can attest to that. Because she is glad that a man, a child, a human being has been born into the world. 22. So the present for you are also in sorrow, in distress, and depressed. In sorrow means in distress or depressed. But I will see you again, and then your hearts will rejoice, and no one can take you from joy, gladness, delight. And you can actually read on your own time, John 16, 20 through 33. And I'm just going to skip to 33. But read that on your own time, you guys. John 16, 20 through 33. 20 through 33. Okay? 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me, and he said a lot of things before that, so you have to read in your own time. I don't want to go through all of that. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, this world that we live in right now, you will have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer. Take courage. Be confident. Be certain. Be undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered you. So listen, you all. When you read this scripture, you can apply this to your own life. And you can say, okay, God, you have told Trail these things. So that in you, God, Trail may have perfect peace and confidence. In this world, Trail will have tribulations and trials and distress and frustration. But I will be of good cheer, God. I will take courage. I will be confident. I will be certain. I will be on a doubt. I have overcome the world. I, and you have deprived the world of power to harm me, Trail, and have conquered it for me, Trail. Y'all see how that works? So when it's saying that, it's saying even in our marriage, we're going to have trouble. Even in raising our children, we're going to have trouble. Even on our job, because it's the world as a whole, and all of these things are, are, are inside of the world, but these things are not necessarily of the world, because we know marriage and family is an entity of God and his family, which is a spiritual thing, right? So we already know what the Bible is telling us as it relates to troubles and trials and tribulations. So anytime you get into a trouble or trial or tribulation, that does not mean that it is time to divorce. That, is, that does not mean I married the wrong person. That does not mean, oh, I should have listened to whomever, because let me tell you that as well you know sometimes people will tell you things and they'll have their opinions of what you should and, and, and should not do based on whatever you know their 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 basis behind it but you being a child of God you being you being someone that has a spirit of discernment I will hope and pray that you prayed for your marriage you prayed for the man that you you, you chose and that God gave you the thumbs up as it relates to it so don't think because you're going through different stress um, stresses or period periods of anguish that you married the wrong person that is a life in the pits of hell now some people may be in different circumstances so this may not be applicable to everyone but if it does apply to you i just ask that you go back to the father and that you get your reassurance from him and not the world okay amen so ephesians 5 did somebody write that scripture for me we're going to do ephesians 5 through 33 i'm going to read that whole thing ephesians 5 and 33 and this is and what i'm going to read in just a minute here is about putting the word to work in our marriage i said marriage is a god idea right so it has to be we have to utilize the word of god as it relates to our marriage so um what I'm going to read here is the basis of how our marriages should be. Now, other scriptures, when I talk about Galatians 5 and 22 through 23, you've heard me talk about that several times, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, in all of our dealings with our husbands and with other people, we should be applying the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, um, meekness, self-control. We should be applying those things to every instance of our life. Hey, Tanja, thank you so much, Crystal. So, you know, that's why I say you have to take the Word of God and apply it to all areas. Romans 12 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. That's a living sacrifice to God. That means that we're mindful of what we eat. We're mindful of what we're doing with our bodies. We're mindful we're single, that we're not abusing our bodies with fornication. We're mindful that we're not abusing our bodies with sexual immorality, uh, other sexual immorality or um, uh, drug abuse or addictions of any kind. We're mindful of what we allow to play in our mind, you know. So when those scriptures, we have to apply those scriptures to different areas and not be one-sided with the scriptures. So Ephesians 5, 22, 25 through 33 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. 
so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her washing of the water with the word. Y'all see that? That he might present the church to himself, read church, the bride, in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such things, that she might be holy and faultless. Even so, husbands should love their wives as wives as being in a sense their own bodies. He who loves his own wife love himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and carefully protects and cherishes it, as Christ does the church. Because we are members, parts of his body, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This mystery is very great, but I speak concerning the relation of Christ and the church. However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife. How many times have we not said that? Let's count. Husbands, love your wife, number one. And then it tells us again, da -da -da. he who loves his own wife loves himself, too, and, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes love, is three. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined his wife, come to flesh. However, let a man, four times in this one scripture, Oh, no, five. Okay, so let's finish reading 33, because I didn't finish reading it. Okay. Love his wife as being, in a sense, his own self, and let the wife see, let the wife see that she respects, hey, Kristen, respects and reverence her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venetrates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. And the reference scripture for that is 1 Peter 3 and 2. And why it doesn't have a mandate, it has love on the end of that, but it doesn't have a mandate for love, is because if you're doing all of these things, if you're reverencing him, if you're noticing him, if you're regarding him, if you're honoring him, if you're preferring him over anything or anyone else besides Christ, if you're doing all of these things, then that is love. Am I right? So when we are in our marriages and when we have different trials and different tribulations and faced with different things, we have to go back to what this says that we're, we should be doing. We have to go back and read Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. We have to go back and read 1 Corinthians 13, chapters, I believe, 1 through 14, when it spells out very detailed what love looks like. So we can apply those things to our marriage. So if you're in a place where there's constant chaos, check your love. Check your respect. Are you demonstrating respect? Is he demonstrating love? Are there things, hidden things in your life, in your past, that is causing these things to be revealed? He's not causing anything. He's not making you do anything. He's not making you react any way, any type of way. There are things that are being revealed as a result of you not being a whole person. And vice versa. So, we got to get to the root of that. What's the root cause of the issue? Oh, he's mean. Why is he mean? Because he doesn't tell me he loves me or he doesn't show me he loves me. Why, why doesn't he tell you he loves you or show you that he loves you? Because he didn't grow up without a father, and he doesn't know how to love me. He didn't grow up without, with the mother, or his mother and him, you know, they, they were not on good terms, or he got abused when he was younger, or he has always been an insensitive person because he never received affection or um, any type of you know, uh, love or hand holding from those people that were supposed to love him, or he grew up in the street, or, you know, he did grow up in a two-parent home, but it wasn't really a structured home, it was just a mom and dad that was there, but they really didn't give him the proper guidance and the proper love that he needed, so therefore, when he got out in the world, he just learned how to thrive and to, to, to go hard and to work, and he's a very hard-working man, he do all these things great, but when it comes to me, he's not sensitive, when it comes to our children, he's not sensitive, he's, he's hard on our son, he's hard on my son, so you gotta look at the root of that. It's not just because. Oh, and you know what? His dad is like that. His granddad is like that. His brothers are all like that. 
right? And vice versa. Because this applies to you as well. Well, because I was neglected. Yeah, I had a father, but my father, you know, ended up leaving my mom. He ended up getting married to somebody else, and he has a, a, a whole other family that he, he, he just, you know, took liking to, and he just really neglected me. He sent the child support money, but that was about it. I saw him at Christmas, and I saw him at Easter, but that was about it. Oh, my uncle molested me, or my cousin, or my big my big brother, or, or somebody touched me, and they shouldn't have touched me. And I thought I got over, and I thought I was well, healed from it, but every time I get into a conflict or a confrontation with my husband, or, or when it's time to be sexual and intimate with him, I still feel myself being drawn back or not wanting to give my all. Or people have uh, manipulated me all my life. They've turned their black back on me. They betrayed me. They blamed me. They, they, they prosecuted me. And because of that, I just have a trust issue. I'm just going to be honest with you. I just have a trust issue. I don't trust nobody. And I, and I really believe that, you know, he can walk out on me at any given time, but at least I'll still have me. At least I'll still have my sanity, or at least I'll still have my children. So you got to think about the root cause of it. And if your mind is constantly telling you those things that I just described just now, you'll never be healed. You'll never be whole. You'll never be able to trust. You'll never be able to love. You'll never be able to go in a deep um, relationship with God or your husband and be vulnerable and be naked and unashamed with him or with God for that matter. Because you're still holding on to too much stuff. There's too much weight. There's too much on the inside that's eliminating that. Okay? So we want to go there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There are different exercises you can do, Keisha, just depending on what it is. There, I mean, pray and fasting should help you get rid of the root cause for the most part. But there are different exercises and things that you have to do. You may have to confront some things. You may have to confront the person that betrayed you or the person that um, neglected you or the person that have uh, uh, abandoned you. Absolutely, Javana. Healing of the mind. It's a process that you go through because even in the word of God, the word is a healing source. The word is a healing source. So in you praying, in you worshiping also, Keisha, not you, I don't know if it's you, but whomever, and also you worshiping, that's that time that you are naked and unashamed before God and you are telling him your truth and you are asking him to heal you and to deliver you from certain areas. So beyond praying and fasting, there may be, there may be some mental exercises that you need to do or other little regiments that you may have to do in order to be fully released and fully restored. And depending on the depth of this, again, you may have to go back to that person and own your truth. Own that you're still upset. Own that you have not gotten over it. Own that you are mad. Own that it makes you feel crazy. Own whatever it is. Because the more you go through your day to day and you allow that thing, whatever that thing is, to control your mood and to control your attitude, that thing or that person still controls you. They still hold the power to you. And nobody should have control over you but the Father. And, and God doesn't control us in that way. He doesn't manipulate us. We're not puppets to him. He doesn't tell us what to do. He gives us suggestions. He gives us, um, you know, his word to go by as, in, as far as instructions is concerned. But he doesn't make us do anything. We are free moral agents. He tells us which way to go. Just as us as parents, we tell our children what to do. But <laughs> they're going to make their own decisions. And we can only trust at some point they're going to come back, right? Did that help you, Keisha? So eight principles, you all. And we got to get off here because we've been on almost an hour. I know it came on a little late, but I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to give you these eight principles. And that healing of the mind, Giovanna, um, that has been big for me. And Joyce Meyer has been one of the greatest influences in my life as it relates to my mind being healed, Keisha. And Giovanna, you're welcome. One of the greatest is because this is the thing garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. What you put in is what you're going to get out, right? You can apply that to spiritual, you can apply that to finances, you can apply that to um, fitness. Come on, Crystal, you're a fitness guru, right? You know, a lot of people say that, oh, I want to be healthy, but what are you eating? Come on, somebody. Are you doing any type of exercise? So what you put in is what you will get out. So that's the same with your marriage. You will get what you give. And even if you have a partner that's not giving, you still give. 
I don't believe in 50-50. I believe in 100-100. You give 100%, 100% of the time. You give 100%, 100% of the time. Now, does that mean that you don't have room for nothing else? Absolutely not. But what that means that what that means is when I give, I'm going to give 100% of myself when I when I give. Expecting nothing in return. And that's hard. Because we're human and we want we want in return. We want it reciprocated. We want to feel what we've gave, given out, right? But look at Jesus. He gave 100% of himself. And he didn't expect anything in return. In fact, in fact, he gave so that he can give us more. Right? He said so that we can have abundant life in John 10 and 10. Somebody please put that scripture up there. And you guys go back and read these scriptures. He said, this thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So not only did he give his life out of obedience and instructions from the Father, but he gave us his life so that we can have life more abundantly. So he did a double whammy just for us. So when we're giving in our marriage, we have to think about Jesus, what did Jesus give? He endured. We're getting, I'm, I'm rocking it out, y'all. I'm rocking it out. Just walk with me. He endured even until the cross. He endured. Somebody put up their uh, Hebrews. Oh, God, what was that scripture? Was it 13? Okay, I got to find my scripture. He endured even to the cross. Hebrews 12 and 1. Somebody put that up there for me, please. He endured. But many of us don't want to endure because we're not used to it. We live in a society where everything is quick, where everything is fast, everything is sudden. So we don't want to endure. We, we don't want to guard up under any type of pressure. Um, let me see what this word means in the Greek. We don't want to guard up any type, in, up any type of pressure. We want it here, fast, and now, here, fast, and now. In the Greek, this is how it's pronounced. Let's see if it plays for me because I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Let's see if you guys can hear that. Untouch, I believe it's untouchy. It's in the Greek. Greek. Remaining behind. A patience, enduring, perseverance, stead fastness steadfastness so sometimes in our marriage we have to endure I know we don't want to remaining under endurance steadfastness especially as God enables the, re the believer to remain under the challenges he allots in life remaining patience constants see the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and pity to even the good trials and sufferings. So you may be enduring not because you married the wrong person. You may be enduring not because he's a horrible person. But because you are. Because you are. Sometimes the innocent does suffer. Look at the life of Jesus. Sometimes there is a period of suffering. There's an appearance of endurance. And when I'm talking about suffering, I'm not talk, talking about, oh, look, oh, woe is me, oh, God. No, this is endurance. Being under, remaining patience through the whole process. And believing that God is going to bring you out on the other side. Not getting impatient, not getting frustrated, not wanting to prove your point, not wanting to um, talk about it right now, not becoming emotionally distraught or disturbed, but just enduring. And in that part of enduring, you're becoming closer to God because in you um, getting closer to God and remaining constant in Him, He will help you to extend grace. He will help you to extend unconditional love. He will help you to guard up under anything that's trying to come your way. He'll help you to have compassion, even when you don't, even when I don't. Even when I don't want to extend grace, He will help us the more time we spend with Him. That's why we spend time with Him. God isn't concerned about how much we can do for him. He's more concerned about how much we become like him. That's a good hashtag, you guys. 
That's a good post. God is not concerned about how much we can do for him. He is more concerned about how much. Okay, we had an interruption just now, so I, I wasn't saying anything, so you didn't miss anything. <laughs> I saw it when it came on, I was not saying anything. So I'm going to give you these eight principles. Are you all enjoying this today? I'm going to give you these eight principles. I want to tell you about the prayer challenge that we're doing. And then um, we'll conclude on next week. Matter of fact, what I'll do today, I'll give you four of the eight principles today. And then we'll do the other four next week and go from there. Is that all right with you all? So endurance. And while I'm, you know, I always self-reflect. And I ask you all to do the same. And I look at every day of my life to see how well I'm enduring. How well I'm allowing God to lead me. How well I'm allowing God to lead my marriage. How well I'm allowing God to lead, of course, my emotions and all aspects of who I am. And anytime I see something missing, lacking, broken, I'm going back to the Father. And I'm asking God, how can I fix that? Or how can you fix this? Because I can't fix it. But what can I do? That's when I talk about exercises, mental exercises, or just different regimens and different things that we can do. How can I get to the root of this, God? Because this thing is still showing up in my life. This thing is still showing up in my marriage. So there's something, apparently there's something on the inside of me or something that's going on around me, something that I have not accepted or rejected, right? That's still allowing this thing. It could be mental. And a lot of it, it is mental. You know, going back to what Javana said, the healing of the mind, your mind... Uh, controls every aspect of your being. So if you have not renewed your mind in certain areas, there could be that could be the reason why you're dealing with certain things still, because your mind is not has not um, been renewed, and it's not a one time thing. You have to constantly. The Bible says the renewing, ing of your mind. Okay, so let me give you four of the eight principles, and then next week we'll go with the remaining four, and go from there. So eight principles that will help you, and I just set the foundation and ground or just then but a four prints four of the eight principles that will help you to stay off of the crazy cycle number one observing the human spirit and these principles i was inspired by dr emerson Egerich. so these are his principles these are not necessarily my principles but i expounded on the things that he gave okay because i don't want to take credit for his amazing amazing teaching so observing the human spirit deflate is an indicator that you are going into a crazy cycle. When you see your spouse emotionally deflate, get off of their air holes. Hmm. I'm going to let that sit right there. Because many of us are master with words. Many of us are master with deflating people or have been that in the past. We know just the right word to say. We know just the right thing to do to piss somebody clear off. We know exactly what to do to get a response. And when you see somebody deflating emotionally, that means that you are entering into a crazy cycle. This can be in the midst of a conversation that goes wrong, a disagreement, a heated fellowship moment, or it can just be a simple dis uh, disruption of communication. And it goes sour. Are you wanting to get your point across? Are you wanting to talk about it right now when they're telling you it's not a good time? When they're telling you they don't want to deal with it right now. But because the way they said they don't want to deal with it right now, you didn't accept the way they said it. So you still want to deal with it right now. So you see somebody's spirit deflating. And they begin to draw back. Get off of their air holes. You are preventing them from being, from having life. And you are preventing them from breathing. And the, this is figuratively speaking. In some cases, literally speaking. Be more observant to people's behavior, to your husband's behavior in particular, to his ways. Observing. Yep, observing the human spirit deflate. 
be more observant to his ways. Learn him. Know when to back off. And I'm something, I'm still learning. I, I've done way better than I used to. Because sometimes I still want to get my point across. Sometimes I still want to say that thing that I know is going to piss them off. I'm just going to be honest with you. My human person, yes, my flesh, knows how to get a response. But by me spending time in the Word of God, by me understanding what Ephesians 5 through 33 says, what 1 Peter 3 1 says, what with uh, 2 Peter 1, I believe 5 says when it talks about how we should behave as Christians when I go and recite Galatians 5 and 22 through 23 of the Bible I can say, God, this is not the right thing to do that's why I say you have to apply the word of God to your marriage because things happen so fast and then you're like, how did we get here? number two, thank you for writing that, Giovanna decode each other vulnerabilities underneath the negative reaction Get to the issue without judging, getting offensive, or being defensive, insecurities, or insensitive. Learn and understand their vulnerabilities. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Lynetta. I'm not thank you, Lynetta. Thank you, Christian. Welcome, Lynetta. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. Learn their vulnerabilities and help them work through it. Listen, we know, you know, our husbands have vulnerabilities. They have weaknesses. So do we. But sometimes, as wives, we play on those things. We can play on those things. And we, we somehow look at them as less of a man because he drinks, because he goes out, because he's not as spiritual, uh, because he may have an element or an issue or a problem or something that he's dealing with, struggling with, struggling through, or because whatever. It's a vulnerability. But guess what, sister? You got some too. So instead of you looking at him and trying to, 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 to size him up and wanting him to be this perfect person, I need you to get that mirror and look at yourself and understand that you are not perfect. By any stretch of the imagination, there is nothing, absolutely nothing perfect about you. Now, we are perfect in Christ. In Christ. But not in our own self as he is perfect in Christ. But not in our flesh. So in the flesh dwells no good thing. It dwells no good thing. So let's not play on each other's vulnerabilities. Learn them so you can help manage them. But don't learn them so that you can help mess them. Or mess them up. Or mess with them. Decode what's going on. When you know he's reacting or responding because of this, that's a vulnerability. That's a weakness. Say, okay, Terrell, I got it. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to draw back. I'm just, I'm just not going to continue in this conversation. I'm not going to try to pull something out of him in this moment because there's, there's something else that's going on here. And I, I acknowledge that. Yes, lint pickers. Yes, Lanettas. I'm not, I acknowledge that. And I'm going to appreciate him in this moment. And love him in this moment, moment, rather than judge him and be critical toward him. Number three, value God's love of pink and blue. I love this. Neither are wrong, just different. And what Emerson bases is behind us is that we women look out the world in pink lenses, and we have pink hearing aids. And men look at the world out of blue lenses, and they ha they listen, and they have pink blue. Uh, ear plugs right so how they look at the world versus us so what does that mean that means that we're different and that means it's okay so nobody is wrong nobody way is wrong per se there may be a better way but the way that he wants to do it I'll go about it is not necessarily wrong it's just different so that's, that's a maturity level, even in us as wives, in, in learning how to accept one another's opinions and views and perspective on how they view and perceive certain things and not telling them you are wrong. You know, that is not the way. No, this, you need to, no, 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 no. Learn the difference, respect the difference. This is what I wrote here. Learn the difference, respect the difference, and feed off of each other differences. We both were created in the image and likeness of God. The word must be 
final authority in your marriage. Neither decision is bad, but one may be better in the moment. Right? What does the word say? If we can't come to the conclusion, because apparently we're operating in flesh, let's go to the word. I'm going to go to the word. I'm going to see what the word has to say about it, because we're not getting to the root of this, and we need to get to the root of this. Okay? And then number four, and we'll go with the other four next week. Accepting a degree of trouble as normal. And Dr. Emerson says the 80-20 rule. Mm. Oh, my live is about to end. So Facebook is giving you a, um, oh, wow, I got four minutes, y'all. Accepting a degree of trouble as normal, the 80-20 rule. If your marriage is great 80% of the time, don't focus on the 20%. If it's 90% of the time, it's good. If it's maybe 95% of the time, it's good. Don't focus on the 10%. Don't focus on the 5%. Focus on the majority of what your marriage looks like. Because we read John 16 and 33. We read John 16 and 20. We're going to have trouble. Things are going to happen. Things are going to come up. And I'll go over this some more next week. So I'll, I'll start off with four next Saturday. And we'll go through eight because my time is um, winding down. Oh, you know what? I won't be on next Saturday. Ouch. Because I'll be at the butterfly effect. Oh, so, oh God. So what I may can do, guys. What I may can do, because we'll be on. What I may can do is do a live after the butterfly effect. That's what I'll do for you. It'll be after the butterfly effect, which is over at 5. So I may come on that evening around 7 or 8 so we can finish this up. Because I don't want to. I know you're like, oh my God, there's more. I want more. Because I want more. And I don't want to hold it off more than a week. So next week we'll come on. It'll be 7 or 8 p.m. that we'll come on and finish this up. Will that work for you? Because we got to get off because Facebook is kicking me off. I guess they have a, a limit now. Never knew. Oh, God. So let me just quickly brief, briefly go over the four topics. Observing the human spirit. Observing when the human spirit deflates. And knowing that that's an indicator that you're going into the crazy cycle. Number two, decode, decoding each other vulnerabilities underneath the negative reaction. Number two, decoding each other vulnerabilities underneath the negative reaction. Number three, valuing God's love, God's love of pink and blue. Neither are wrong, just different. Valuing God's love of pink and blue. Neither are wrong, just different. And that God's love of pink and blue is basically God made us different. I mean, he made us different people, so we have a different way of doing things and being, right, as man and woman. And then number four, accepting a degree of trouble as normal, the 80-20 rule. Accepting a degree of trouble as normal. And again, it could be the 90-10 for you. It could be the 95-10. The ninety three seven, it can be the ninety seven three, whatever. Uh, Doctor Emerson Egridge, Doctor Emerson Egridge, E G G E R I C H, I believe is his last name. Emerson E M E R S O N. I I do uh, encourage you to get the Love and Respect book. Love and Respect book, and I'll be using a lot of his material as it relates to his viewpoints and things of that nature especially on the loving point the loving point the loving respect because he's on point with that and again i was going through that for some time i had no idea what that it had a name and all this time all this time he had a name okay so last thing here you guys have, that have not uh signed up to be a part of the wives in warfare and worship 30-day prayer challenge i need you to sign up we have 62 i think when i last checked 62 people that have registered it's a free challenge so there is no cost to you but we are committing to praying at 5 30 a.m uh every morning monday through friday and on saturdays we can be a little flexible flexible but hopefully by seven o'clock you're up and praying on saturday and sunday and, and spending time with god but i'm going to have a live video on the 31st at 8 p.m all of this is in the instructions uh, so when you go sign up, all of this information is there. It's going to tell you what you're going to get. It's going to tell you what you need to do to check in. It's going to tell you um, um, how the challenge is going to go because we're not going to be on live every day. We're only going to be alive three days out of that week, three or four days, and one day will be the wife check-in. So it's going to tell you all of that. The challenge is free. Go to wivesinwarfare.eventbrite.com, wivesinwarfare.eventbrite.com uh, to register and I want to see many of you that are uh, 
Oh gosh, I want to see many of you go ahead and sign up for that challenge. Because I know it's going to be a life changer for your marriage. I know it's going to be a life changer for you. And that Thursday night, Thursday night, because we're going to be praying together Friday, the 1st, 5.30 a.m. So that Thursday night, I'm going to go over uh, warfare. I'm going to go over worship, the importance of worship, and how we're going to go about this. So 30 minutes a day, let me tell you, I spent almost two hours this morning with, with God. It goes by so very fast. So... Go check it out. My time is ending. I have like three seconds. Go check it out. And we will go from there. I may get back on you guys. Anyway, zero time. I may hop right back on so I can... Um